To explain the two-film theory, we will look at the situation where we have two different phases and we have transport of a substance from phase one to phase two. So we have some kind of turbulence in the two phases, so the concentration is constant. Up to you come close to the boundary between the two, the phase boundary, uh, where the concentration decreases and then you have a concentration at exactly at the border and then there's a jump in concentration uh, to the second phase and the relation between those two co concentrations is hopefully given by an equilibrium and then far away from the border you have a constant concentration. So things happen close to the phase boundary here but it's a bit difficult to say what exactly happens but the two-film theory doesn't care. Uh, the two-film theory simplifies matter and say that Everything is constant up to a certain exact point. And then what happens uh, happens in a certain film with a certain thickness uh, in the two phases. So hence the name two film theory. You have a film in which the concentration changes in phase one and you have a film in phase two where the concentration changes. And the two film theory takes things a step further. So if we look at these two films with a thickness delta 1 here and delta 2 in the second phase, the two film theory says that let's assume that the concentration gradients are linear. Like that. So constant up to this point and then it changes. So when do you have linear concentration gradients? Well you have linear concentration gradients if you have equimolar counter diffusion, right? So the two film theory works nicely if you have uh, equimolar counter diffusion. We will talk about uh, distillation later uh, and there you can have equimolar counter diffusion if you have distillation of a binary system, so system with two components. If you have no heat losses and uh, evaporation alpha p that is independent of the composition, you can get an equimolar counter diffusion. You don't need to understand that in this context, but when we talk about distillation, we will explain why that is so. So, can you use the two film theory if you have diffusion through stagnant component? Yes and no. The thing is that if you use the two film theory, you assume that you have a linear concentration gradient, right? And the diffusion into stagnant component or Stefan diffusion, that says that the concentration isn't linear, right? But during certain circumstances, the nonlinearity you get in Stefan diffusion is so small, so it's negligible. And when is it like that? I recommend you to, to think about that and try to figure out when do you have a situation in Stefan diffusion where you have such low uh, nonlinearity that you can actually assume it to be a linear concentration gradient and uh, not introduce any big errors. And if you do have a nonlinear one, you still can almost uh, use the two film theory or you it's just that you have to twiddle a bit uh, with what happens exactly in, how, uh, in these films. So what do I mean with that? Well let's look at the equimolar counter diffusion. You have this equation here for that situation. Let's compare that with mass transfer coefficients, then you have an equation like this. And you see that these two equations have the same form. So if equimolar counter diffusion is the only thing that happens in the film, then you can use mass transfer coefficients and the mass transfer coefficient is exactly the diffusivity divided with the film thickness. Another way to say the same thing is to say that if you use mass transfer coefficients, you're implicitly assuming that the concentration gradients are linear. And the mass transfer coefficients may have different units. 
And the reason why it's so, it's because you can express the difference between the two phases in different units. So if you express it as a difference in concentration, you get one numerical value for the mass transfer coefficient, since you have one particular unit. And if you instead ex express the difference as a difference in partial pressure, then you get another unit and another numerical value. Or if you, for example, use the rather strange unit we use in for moist water to express the water content, kilogram of water per kilogram of dry air, you get yet another unit and yet another numerical value for the mass transfer coefficients. But they are all related since we describe the same system. So if you calculate one, you can calculate the other like this. OK, so we said that you assume linear concentration gradients if you use mass transfer coefficients. Yeah, essentially. Uh, can you then use the two film theory and mass transfer coefficients for a case when you have diffusion through stagnant component? Yeah, especially in the case where the concentration gradients become very close to linear. So remember, if you had equimolar counter diffusion, the concentration gradient is linear. And if you have diffusion into stagnant component, you have convection. And the convection pushes the gradient like that. Now, what happens if the concentrations are really small? You see that we have natural logarithm here, ln of 1 minus y. The limit, if you let y approach 0, is that ln of 1 minus y approaches minus y. So then you can remove the natural logarithm, and the equation turns into something that looks exactly like the equation for equimolar counter diffusion. So if you have a large y value, then the convection pushes a lot. But if you have a small value, small values on both sides, then the convection pushes so little, so it's essentially not bent. Another way to look at that is to say that, OK, let's go back to the equation we started with. What happened if y is very small? Well, then the convection term essentially disappears. And then we're left with the same equation we started with when we derived the equation for equimolar counter diffusion. So if you have equimolar counter diffusion, you can calculate the mass transfer coefficient directly from the diffusivity and the distance. Well, you have to know that diff distance. But if you do, you can do that. If you instead have diffusion into stagnant component. Well, if you have low concentrations, you're home safe again, because uh, then you essentially get the same equation as for equimolar counter diffusion. But if you have large y values, well, you can actually still use mass transfer coefficients. The problem is that they are not so nicely related now uh, to the diffusivity and to the distance. So what can happen if you use mass transfer coefficients for a situation where it's clearly not uh, the case that you have a, a linear concentration gradient is that if you change the temperature uh, or other operating conditions, things might change in a way that it's a bit more difficult to estimate or predict. So for equimolar counter diffusion, we can calculate uh, the mass transfer coefficient from the diffusivity. And we might not be able to do that in Stefan diffusion. So we form a dimensionless unit to tell us the relation uh, or show us how different they are. And the Sherwood number then is the mass transfer coefficient times the distance divided with the mass diffusivity. And for small concentrations, thus we get a Sherwood number of one. And for large con uh, concentrations, we get a Sherwood that's far away from one.